Hello and welcome back to Tinker Talks Guns. Mauser was one of the great innovators of the late 19th and early 20th century, um, creating everything from military rifles to the C-96, the first really practical and commercially successful mass-produced semi-automatic pistol. And, um, which oddly never really got the military contracts they were hoping for. Although Chinese warlords bought the hell out of them, um, because they neatly evaded some import restrictions. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. The main thing is, is that by the first years of the 20th century, they could see the way the wind was blowing and in terms of semi-automatic pistol design, and it was not blowing towards guns like the broom handle Mauser, which, again, while it was, remained relatively popular, it did not get the sort of military contracts they were seeking. So they decided to introduce a line of pistols that would all have a common look and many common features, but these would span the entire range of calibers from 45 ACP down to 25 auto. And the 45 and 9mm versions never quite gelled, uh, and rather than fighting it, uh, they said, okay, we'll come back to that and introduced the, in their 1910 catalog a new pistol, the Mauser 6.35mm, which is now known as the 1910 because it first appeared in the catalog in 1910. And four years later, they introduced the 7.65 Mauser, a slightly larger version. And of course, 7.65 or 32 ACP. And since it was introduced in 1914's catalog, it's called now the model of 1914, even though Mauser never used that nomenclature. These were very, very popular pistols, and they incorporated a lot of features that seem strange now and were certainly unique at the time. But you have to remember, the time they were making these, the thing coming out, the conventions of semi-automatic pistols were still being settled. So let's have a look at these on the tabletop, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. First things first, unload and show clear. The 7.65, or 32 ACP, has an 8-round magazine. Nothing in the chamber. Magazine's empty. 25, or 6.35 millimeter, has a 9-round magazine. And again, magazine and chamber are empty. Now, the strangeness begins because if you rack the slide, it locks back on the empty magazine. However, there's no manual bolt release or slide release. It's completely internal. So the only way to drop the slide is to insert a fresh magazine. And then it drops into battery. And it's odd, but it's not the worst idea in the world. And again, at the time, the conventions of some automatic pistols were not well established. So it locks back, you unload, I'm trying to show you as much of the pistol while I do this. And when you slap in a new magazine, boom, you're back in battery, ready to go instantly. Kind of handy, but gosh, it would have been nice to have a manual slide release. <laughs> because when you're taking it apart or otherwise fussing with it, it's kind of a pain to have to insert a magazine every time you drop the slide. It means you need to have an empty magazine, which is not the best thing in the world. The 25, absolutely the same way. Put the magazine in, drops the slide, and there you go. The weirdness continues with the safety, which again is the same on both guns. You push it down to engage it, and it's really quite handy, very easy to use. And to take it off, you don't push it up because you can't. You have to press this button to release the safety. Again, it's just the same on both guns. That's why I'm doing one video, because there's no point in giving them each their own video when they're essentially the same gun. Um, 
So anyway, it's, it's not a bad feature, but it's not one we're used to, and it would take a little getting used to. Now, <clears throat> there are differences between the guns, as you can see. This one has nice little serrations, and this one has these knob-like projections with serrations. Both of them are just as easy to use. I'm not really sure why they did this on this gun. I'm sure it would have worked just fine with just the flat serrations, but there you has it. So, interesting thing about both of these guns, particularly about the 25, is that the sights are actually pretty good. And not just good for a pocket pistol of the era, they're better than the sights on a lot of service pistols of the era. The 25 has a V-notch rear and a tapered post front. And very easy to use, very easy to get good aim and fire accurately. Similar, but not quite the same, on the 32, there's a U-notch rear sight and, a, you know, more of a traditional half-moon square cross-section. But again, very eminently usable. The trigger pull on these is good, in a way. It's not heavy at all. But there's a fair bit of take up and a little mushy on the release. But in practice, this really isn't a problem when shooting them. I don't even notice it. Both guns are very easy to shoot accurately in rapid fire, even at ranges of seven yards. This is pretty unusual for a 25. This, you will note, is larger than most 25s. Most would be significantly smaller. But that's all to the good, because it's much easier to manipulate and handle and control. And with nine rounds, one in the chamber, ten shots, most 25 autos hold six or seven in the magazine, some hold eight. But 25 ain't much. A couple extra rounds is not a bad thing. <laughs> and this gun really is so easy to handle and so accurate you could use it for small game hunting in place of a 22 semi-auto. Now, disassembly is as unconventional as the rest of the gun, but it's not difficult. You'll note there's a little button here. If you push that in, it allows you to rotate this piece, and you have to pull the slide back just a little to rotate it the rest of the way over. Once you do, it pulls out. Then you lock the slide back, and you can just lift the barrel right out. And the barrel has a post that engages in a hole in the frame, as you can see, in and out very easily. And when fully assembled, this pin goes up the center of the guide rod, through a hole in the frame, into the hole where the barrel back post sits and locks everything together. Now from here, to disassemble the gun, you push the magazine in, the slide comes forward, and you can slide it right off once you remove the magazine. And be careful, because the striker is under tension, caught on the sear, and that little sear is the only thing holding it in place. You don't want to bump this, and for the love of God, you don't want to pull the trigger, because that spring will vanish into oblivion, probably never to be seen again. So you can see there's a guide rod here, hollow for the uh, assembly pin to pass through. And really, that's all there is to it. And again, the 25 Auto is just the same. There's nothing really different about it. Reassembly. Insert the spring into the stirrup at the front. And you actually want to get it into the stirrup. And then slide the slide into place. Pull it back, lock it to the rear. Drop the barrel in. Reinsert the assembly pin. Rotate it over this lug. Press the button. And when you put a magazine in, you're back in battery ready to go. So... 
They're very unconventional looking. You'll notice there's no overhang really at the back or beaver tail as we're used to. But really, this isn't a problem because the slides are high enough that even with my Puji hands, I, I never get slide bite from either of these guns. And again, they're they're both very soft recoiling, of course, and they're very, very, very pleasant to shoot. And um, the 32, as you can see, is quite a bit chunkier. 25 is actually quite quite narrow. And the grips are certainly a little bit on the fat side, but that's all to the good with my large hand. And the top of the grip provides a lovely shelf to brace my thumb on. So, the Mauser 6.35 and 7.65, or as we know them today, the 1910 and the 1914. Now, there are variations of these guns, and modern collectors have applied names to those um, based on the year that the changes appeared in the catalog. So they call this a Model 1910. Mauser never used the term, but we got to tell them apart somehow, I suppose. And since this has a different side plate, that would make this a 1910-14. In 1914, there used to be a lever here to lever up on this plate so that you could remove the side plate when the slide was off, and that would expose the internal mechanism for repair or cleaning. And again, same on this gun. There's a little plate there, very closely fitted, that you can pop out to access the internals. And it's a little odd because there's no plate on this side, so the gun is kind of asymmetrical. But that really only bothers me when I'm looking at it, because in my hand, you, you can't tell. So... This may be a 1914, it may be a 1914 slash whatever. I don't know. I don't care enough to have found out. Um, it's just a great gun. I really enjoy these little Mausers. And um, honestly, if extra magazines were affordable, I wouldn't to this day feel particularly unarmed with this 32. It's very reliable. It's quite accurate fun to shoot, easy to shoot, beautifully made, and very high quality. And it's just a great little gun. And it's funny because these never became iconic the way the broom handle did. Although they made, I believe, considerably more of these guns than they did of the C96. So it's a fantastic gun. You can still find them in the decent, pretty good shootable condition in the four to five hundred dollar range and um if you like old guns and you like interesting and different guns you could do a lot worse like i said they're great great shooters and very reliable so anyway if you've enjoyed the video please hit like and also if you want to support my endeavors paying for ammunition guns etc um, you can click the link below in the description and support me on Patreon. And that would be very much appreciated and very helpful. Anyway, I hope this finds you well. Stay safe, take care, and we'll talk to you again real soon.